I could do you a favor and briefly tell you what's in the book. But I'm not going to. Um, so you actually might have to read it. Um, instead, I'm going to actually talk about some things that are not in the book at all. Hope, I mean, you'll have to tell me afterwards if there was no relationship whatsoever. But, um, and for anybody who, and, and I'm actually not going to speak at any length about the sort of model of a participatory economy. So I, I would encourage anybody, although of course it can come up in question and answer, but I'm not going to do an extensive presentation of the model of participatory economics. I mean, it's laid out in brief in the first part of the first, thir you know, the first dialogue in the book. Um, anybody who is, that's really where your interest is, I would encourage you to please come to the talk Saturday where you'll have a lot of, I will sort of have presented it and you'll have it fresh in your mind, the parts you hate and the parts you want to challenge and all of that. Um, and also, I, I would, it, in addition to getting information about that, that's available to you on the, the handout. The, um, I, would, I would certainly encourage everybody to go to the website that's also in the back, which is newly available and basically is newly launched here also, um, the website participatory economics slash info. Um, here's, what, here's what I would do to start us off. Um, I'm going to briefly give you what I call an honest review of our past. Now, who's our? People who believe that there's a desirable, feasible alternative to capitalism. That's who I mean by our. So I just want to give a brief review of our past. I think it's important to sort of remember, because we now have a long history. Um, and the real purpose for doing that is I think there have been times when we have felt very, very self-confident that we really don't need this capitalist albatross around our legs. If we could just get rid of it, we have a much better idea about how to organize human economic activities. There have been times when there was a great deal of self-confidence amongst the we about that, and then there have been times when I think there has been considerably less self-confidence amongst the we about things like that. And I think reviewing how that all sort of sorted out, you know, briefly just remembering it, it is useful. So I'm going to do that. Um, then I'm going to tell you who Robin Hanell and Eric Olin Wright are. Um, actually, I'll do that first right now. Um, Eric and I come at the issue of a desirable alternative to capitalism from different camps. Um, and we're known to come from different camps. And I think that when the New Left Project, you know, people from the New Left Project approached us, um, they approached us about a debate that would actually originally have been just online, sort of posted every month. Um, <clears throat> and, it's, and, and that's what anybody would assume, that there would be a pretty contentious debate here from people coming from two well-known people coming from two rather distinct camps about what's, how should we think about a desirable alternative to capitalism. Um, I mean, I'm best known as a proponent of comprehensive participatory planning. Um, I'm also a self-declared market abolitionist. I think I declared myself to be a market abolitionist in the 80s, so it's been a while. Um, and I'm a believer that at some point, something, some sort of revolutionary system rupture has got to take place, that you don't just go from a system that's based on competition and greed to a system that is equitable cooperation. It's, it's a change in system. And it's somehow, there's, there's, there's sort of a, I think Mike Albert used to call it the bump, um, which got him in a lot of trouble. That wasn't a, that wasn't a very good phrase. Um, now, Eric is a widely respected proponent of worker self, what, what has been called worker self-managed market socialism. Um, although he doesn't particularly love the label market socialism, but that's the camp that he's well known to have been part of for a long, long time. Um, who does not think that markets need to be replaced entirely 
for a system to be for an economic system to be desirable, and who argues for social transformation that proceeds gradually um, via what he calls symbiotic and interstitial strategies. I'll explain that. But it's a gradual transition rather than some sort of system change rupture. Um, and it's sort of markets have problems, but we can cope with them. Um, so it looks like we're very different. Um, on the other hand, what readers of this book, I believe, will discover is we have much more in agreement than disagreement. And I think at this point in time, that's particularly important for everybody who is disenamored of capitalism. Um, anyway, I'll come back to that. So what I'll do at the end is I'll sort of summarize what I think are these incredibly important areas of agreement that we came to. Um, and that was something that I, on my side, I discovered that in part by writing the book with Eric. Um, I did not expect us to agree on as many things as it turned out that we really, I mean, sometimes we're using different words, but you know, if it comes down to the same thing, it comes down to the same thing. Um, and then I will briefly highlight what I think are still the, maging, the major areas in which we do have disagreements. Um, and then say a few words about why I think any of this is of importance. Why with all of the incredible problems we face and the organizing needs and the intellectual needs, we have to figure out new strategies to to cope with the new economic crisis and the climate crisis that's looming over our head, how could it possibly be of any importance for people to be spending time thinking about alternatives to capitalism? I, I have some reasons that I think that, that, that it's not a waste of our time. OK, here's the honest review of our past. I'm going to break it down to prior to 1917. I think prior to 1917, people who thought of themselves as anti-capitalists felt confident that they had a desirable alternative. I think their attitude was mostly, all we have to do is rid ourselves of this capitalist albatross around our necks, and workers would not only be free to manage their own economic affairs, but the associated producers and consumers um, could quickly establish whatever democratic procedures were needed to coordinate their division of labor. Now, just to be accurate, there were already differences between Marxists and anarchists dating well back into the 19th century. I'm not trying to deny that. But regarding the vision of anti-capitalists prior to 1917 of the alternative to capitalism that people were thinking about, I think there was far more agreement than disagreement, and I think there was a high level of confidence. Now, if you take the period from 1917 to 1989, it's a very different situation. There were now three distinct camps that were quite at odds with one another. And basically, there were three sort of alternatives. Of the three different camps, two of the alternatives made considerable headway in the real world. Marxist-Leninists supported the kind of centrally planned economies that were pioneered in the Soviet Union, put in place in Eastern Europe, after World War II, and then implemented in China, North Korea, Cuba, Vietnam by victorious national liberation movements. Now, while Trotskyists, Stalinists, and Maoists differed over who remained true to Marx's vision, all supported centrally planning of a publicly owned economy. And I think this is very important. In the period from 1917 to 1989, Marxist-Leninists felt even more confident than ever before that there was a desirable alternative to capitalism because it existed someplace in the real world, even if flawed, even if hampered. Social Democrats, this is the period 1917 up to 89, denounced the totalitarian elements of the communist alternative to capitalism for the very early, from the very earliest years. Prior to World War II, Social Democrats called for what they called we want an economy of democratic planning as an alternative to both capitalism and Soviet-style communism. But democratic planning was a catch-all phrase interpreted to mean almost anything 
It was not a coherent model or alternative. And it was clear that social de democrats were becoming less and less confident about their alternative to capitalism as the century proceeded. Then after World War II, social democrats stopped calling for system change and instead supported taming capitalism via regulation, Keynesian macroeconomic policies, indicative planning, national wage negotiations, a generous welfare state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't mean to demean that. The last 30 years of the neoliberal resurgence of vicious capitalism has wiped out something that was far superior. And I don't in any way mean to demean the accomplishments of mostly social democratic political parties in achieving the kinds of reforms that were achieved in the middle of the 20th century. But I'm simply saying that with regard to belief in a really different system, clearly social democracy in the last half of the 20th century ceased to really believe in a different system. Um, for a majority of social democrats, the choice was between a worse version of capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, and a better version of capitalism, social democratic capitalism. Now, a minority of left-wing social democrats, and many who came to be known as new leftists, um, who came of age in the 1960s, came to support what is now referred to as sort of worker self-managed market socialism. Um, that didn't mean they necessarily supported Tito and the Yugoslav communists who built an economy along these lines from 51 to 80. But that was the vision that was sort of a clearly, it was a clear vision in some people's minds during this time period. Now, with some more hindsight, in many respects, this model of a worker self-managed market socialism um, is very similar to the cooperativist vision of a system of worker and consumer cooperatives engaging in market exchange. And that cooperativist tradition had branched off from political anti-capitalism way back in the 1900s. Um, and I think that's actually something interesting to bear in mind when we're trying to figure out what is the thinking about all of this that, that we have gone through in one way or another. Who, what was the third camp that existed between 1917 and 1989? I call them libertarian socialists. That includes anarchists, but includes people who wouldn't have called themselves anarchists. They criticized both central planning and social democracy from the get-go as perversions and betrayals of the initial anti-capitalist vision. And as libertarian socialists continued to comp and they competed very actively with Marxist, Leninists, and social democrats right up to 1939 with the disastrous defeat of the, of, in Spain, and then virtually disappeared from sight until 1989. Okay, next period, 1989 to roughly, to, well, to 2008, when capitalism got its comeuppance. Um, so from, two, from, from 1989 to 2008, centrally planned socialism quickly vanished, first in Eastern Europe, then in the Soviet Union, finally in China and Vietnam, North Korea and Cuba remain the only countries where central planning is still practiced. And it, central planning has very few supporters as an alternative to capitalism today. Now, this produced a serious intellectual crisis that anti-capitalists have been groping with ever since. A majority of social democrats had given up on an alternative to capitalism 40 years earlier. And the precipitous collapse of central planning and what had long been called the socialist bloc now created a serious crisis of confidence for many, many other people. So the bad news was that the ranks of the anti-capitalist camp were greatly depleted. Well, there's some good news. The good news was that once the false gob of communism was dead, and once social democracy was no longer concerned with system change, serious soul searching began in, earn in, in, in earnest. For all who were th thoroughly disenamored of capitalism and remain convinced that the human species is capable of much better, thinking instead of phrase mongering and denouncing others became necessary and intellectual search for a desirable alternative to capitalism was once again the order of the day. I think that was a, in some ways it was a wonderful clearing of space for something that needed to happen even at the same time that the ranks of anybody who was even thinking about this were, were tremendously de depleted. <clears throat>
So with hindsight, I don't think it's surprising that for more than a decade following 1989, many flowers bloomed, so to speak. In the US, Marxist journals like Monthly Review and Science and Society published special issues devoted to the future of socialism. In my view, hoping to preserve interest in some sort of comprehensive central planning in a more democratic form. That was essentially what those journals were attempting to do. Um, new versions of market socialism were elaborated by John Romer, David Schweikert, Michael Howard, among others. And Eric launched the Real Utopias project. Michael Albert and I championed the model of a participatory economy, which was sort of featured in Z Magazine and then on ZNet. Anarchism of every stripe reemerged among young activists in the anti-globalization movement with their own journals and manifestos. And publishers like AK Press and PM Press in the United States republished classic anarchist works along, the new, along with new anarchist theorists about, about, the, about alternatives to capitalism. Journals like Capitalism, Nature, Socialism abandoned old Marxist crisis theory, that was when James O'Connor was there at chief editor, and for a capitalism destroys nature storyline and eco-socialism as that's the alternative and the only way to solve the environmental crisis. That was sort of under the editorship of Joel Cavell. And finally, <clears throat> advocates for what is called sometimes the new economy or the future economy, people like Garl Perovitz, have rejoined the discussion about economic system change as well. Since 2008, so the global economic crisis really marked a turning point. When the crisis hit, there was what we might call a small intellectual industry, in the US at least, offering three different products. Comprehensive democratic planning. I was in, I, that was my firm. I was, I was in that. That, that's where I was in the industry. Market socialism, Eric was there, amongst many others, and a new thing called community-based economics. Um, the economic crisis, the emergence of Occupy movement in the United States and similar movements elsewhere, has stimulated much greater interest in alternatives to capitalism, at the same time that I think the debate among the three camps has become much more, a much more thoughtful dialogue. So while differences remain, and they always will, what's beginning to emerge, I believe, is a very robust consensus regarding the values that must guide an alternative to capitalism. And that's incredibly important. Lots of times, that's all you need. A broad consensus on many of the major institutional features of an alternative to capitalism that's desirable. And three, a more respectful understanding of why people remain concerned about some aspects of what others have proposed. In particular, many differences have been reduced to differences of opinion about situations that will arrive in the future and about which we will learn a lot more before we get there. And the important thing is, is the quality of the discussion now sufficiently high so that we can once again feel more confident that we really don't need these capitalists. We don't need this albatross around our neck. We really do understand what we can do instead. So <laughs> that's why I think that and in this book, I, I've, I've heard back from various people already from the various camps. And the thing that sort of they remark most about it is, well, that's an actual very, I mean, there's actually a discussion going on rather than a screaming match. Um, okay, so there's, there's my interpretation of where we've been. Um, let me jump to the punchline about why we should care that there is a growing feeling of confidence among some people, as many people as possible, that there really is a desirable alternative to capitalism and we can do it. It's feasible and it's desirable and people have got their heads screwed on right this time. Because we clearly didn't always in the past. Um, and then I'll go back over the, 
sort of what I think are the, what Eric and I discover we agree on or, do, or don't. So this is why does this matter? Why do we worry about alternatives to capitalism? Well, thinking through how we will build post-capitalist economies before the time comes, it's critical to the outcomes once we arrive. If there's a single lesson that I've learned from history, this is not something that all you have to do is get rid of the old system and it will be readily apparent to everybody how to set up a wonderful new system. I mean, if we've learned anything from history, that's just not the way it happens. That's not, don't expect that. History has proved that, that postponing serious discussion on these issues is a sure road to disaster. I would also say that just from a, an intellectual logical point of view, it's very difficult to devise strategy without some idea of where you're trying to get. Um, but I don't think that's actually the most important reason for continuing to try and improve the quality of discussion about alternatives to capitalism. Provided we discuss alternatives in ways that are not unnecessarily divisive, more thoughtful work on alternatives to capitalism is going to pay dividends in the here and now, even where system change is decades in the future. Only because there were a core of anti-capitalist activists in the great labor movements of the early 20th century who had no doubts about more desirable alternatives to capitalism, was it possible to win reforms that Thomas Piketty has now reminded us were truly unique in the history of capitalism? Only because the most dedicated fighters in labor struggles had no use for capitalism and capitalists were reformist leaders in those movements able to point, their anti point to their anti-capitalist allies during negotiations and say, hey, you don't deal with me and give in to my demands, you will soon have to deal with them. In other words, radicals and reformers once packed a more powerful punch than any counter punches yet delivered since the current economic crisis hit over seven years ago. How many of you have been sitting around asking yourself, seven years into the Great Depression, there was a tremendous sort of amount of movement. Nobody was tolerating austerity seven years into the Great Depression. And yet, there seems to just be this, well, the question is, why haven't the movements arisen? And I'm not saying there's a simple answer. I'm not saying there's a single answer. And I'm not saying that there haven't been various important things that have arisen. But I still believe that the kind of counterpunches we've seen um, still don't compare to what was thrown and the, and, and, the, and the reforms that were achieved during the last economic crisis. In other words, we're going to need to punch much harder in the future. And being more confident that we really don't need capitalists at all, I think helps very, very much in the right here and now. So that's why I think that that project is not a useless project that ought to be postponed indefinitely. Um, so what, again, I told you I'm not going to do you the favor of making it possible not to read the book, but I'll outline what I think you're going to discover. At least when I read the book, this is the way I read it. Um, oh, these guys rather surprisingly, seem to agree on a bunch of things. What are they? Uh, it turns out that Eric and I, I think, have very few, if any, disagreements with regard to what does economic democracy really mean? What does economic justice really mean? What does environmental sustainability really mean? And if that's what they really mean, what is it that they require? Now, I'm not saying that in these three camps that everybody who's in all three of these camps agrees on this. But here are two of us from two of the three camps. And I don't think on those questions there is really enough disagreement you know, to bother about. My reading is that both Eric and I more or less evaluate past successes and failures of the anti-capitalist movement very much in the same way. Um, we both certainly agree that workers must manage themselves. And here's an important point. We also agree, more or less, 
where there's a lot of agreement amongst both of us on what problems arise when workers and consumers use markets to coordinate their activities. It's not that I see a whole host of problems and Eric denies that those problems arise. There's a tremendous amount of agreement on what kinds of problems arise when you use markets. And there's also a tremendous amount of agreement on what problems comprehensive planning has to overcome. Again, Eric raises a lot of those problems, and I'm not in disagreement that those problems exist and you have to look for answers to those problems. We both agree that a desirable alternative to capitalism must be thoroughly democratic, and that implies that it can only come about when a substantial majority of the population support it. We both agree that since Eric and I believe that, this implies we are still decades away from economic system change in most places, so that the issue of revolutionary rupture is not on the table at present, with the possible exceptions of a few countries. <laughs> that would have been too fortunate. And then the last thing we agree on is, for the time being at least, in most countries, transition strategy must consist of what I call winning reforms, and Eric calls symbiotic organizing, combined with what I call building imperfect experiments in equitable cooperation, and Eric calls interstitial strategies. We use different names for it. I'm a retired professor. He hasn't retired yet. So he has to use words that are more suited to academic settings, and I can dispense with that for the time being, forever, actually. Um, but if you look at what he means by those things and what I mean by those things, we both agree that strategy for the moment is essentially working on both of those projects because we do not yet have um, anything like enough public support for a different system to really be thinking about, well, thinking about very difficult, complicated issues about how do you actually bring that about when the constellation of forces have gotten to the point where there's real possibilities. I, I would not, when I say there are some exceptions, I, I, I think Greece is an exception. I hope Spain becomes an exception soon. It's certainly an exception in Venezuela where they're already on, I mean, they're already reached that point. So there are some places in the world where system change is on the agenda and, or soon will be on the agenda. But that is certainly not true for the majority of the Eurozone. It's certainly not true for us in the United States. Um, it's not true for a majority of the populations in the advanced economies. Where do we disagree? <coughs> well, we disagree mainly over markets versus democratic planning. And one thing I learned from writing the dialogue with Eric is that the reasons we disagree on this I think are actually rather straightforward when all is said and done. I think what it basically comes down to is this. I fear the socially corrosive effects of markets more than Eric does. And I believe attempts to ameliorate those effects or tame markets, as some market socialists have put it, will prove less satisfactory than Eric does. On the other hand, Eric is more skeptical than I am about whether the participatory planning procedure that is that I propose to replace the market system will prove to be practical and perhaps even desirable. He worries that it's untested and people might find it unnecessarily burdensome. And I think what you'll discover in the core of the back and forth that we engage in on those subjects. You'll essentially hear him presenting his concerns and doubts and me giving my best answer, recognizing that those are perfectly sensible things to worry about and saying, well, this is why I think it can be solved. And on the other side, since he says, 
well, in the end, we shouldn't really envision eliminating markets altogether, then I say, well, here's what concerns me about that. And then he goes ahead and answers my concerns as best he can. And you as the reader will, of course, agree with me, right? Yeah, okay. I was joking before that if Eric can't come in, it's okay. I know what he says, and I could give his talk too, but I would do him the favor of leaving out the very few places where he's wrong. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you. Um, I think for anybody who is interested in um, thinking about alternatives to capitalism, this is a really good read. And I'm very, very happy that the New Left Project people, Eric and I would never, it would never have occurred to us to do this. And it's really rather strange. Um, Eric and I have never personally met. We went to the same college. He was a year ahead of me. We were both active in SDS. Then we both became sort of new leftists and sort of academics and activists in the same movements. And we've never met. Um, and we knew that we sort of were in two different camps on this issue we both spend a lot of time on. Um, I'm really happy that, that the New Left Project people said, well, let's get these people to engage a little bit. Um, I learned a lot more about how much agreement there is. Um, and also learn to respect some perfectly sensible reasons to worry about how planning can work out. I guess we, we, we found, we just thought it would be helpful to have a little brief summary of what is meant by participatory economics and what is meant by market socialism. That would be helpful. Sure. And my comrades and advisors told me that I should have done more of that in the first place. Um, Should we see if there are, do, do other people want that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I mean, market socialism is easier to explain because you can compare it to capitalism a little bit. So there's no stockholders, and the workers that work at enterprises, they are sovereign over their enterprise. Sovereign in the sense that they get to decide to produce whatever they want, and they get to decide to do it whatever they, whatever they, they want. And basically, they get to, they get to decide to, to compensate themselves in whatever, they, they, in whatever way they want. Um, so, and then, well, you, you no longer have capitalists owning the firms. You now have the workers. Do they own them? Well, that's, that, then there's some subtleties. I mean, do they really own that? Could they sell it and then go vacation in the Caribbean? So you've got some questions to answer about any system that are sort of complicated, but that's the big, the big picture is that that's the big change. And well, and the, and the other part of, of market socialism has been, has been, well, that central planning was just a disaster. And so the problem was that we threw out the baby with the bathwater. The markets are, there's no reason that you still have to coordinate you know, exchanges of intermediate goods you know, between these enterprises, and you still have to somehow, how is it that consumers get things? Well, market socialism has said, you can do that through markets. And we have a lot of experience with markets, and markets do some things very well, and then they do certain things very badly. You don't want to leave income distribution entirely up to markets. So you might intervene in that area. Um, I think a lot of market socialists would also say, given recent experience with finance, that you certainly don't want to have free market finance, even if these firms are not capitalist-owned, even if the, the bank is not a capitalist-owned bank. Um, but that, in essence, is the vision of market socialism, that we change who owns things and we change who gets to decide how things are produced and what they're produced, but we do not abandon markets as our system of coordinating all that. Um, participatory economics... Um, says, no, we really need to get rid of the markets because even when markets are more like cancer than they are, and this was a, a big, you'll, you'll discover that this was a contentious part of the book. So I compare markets to cancer where, no, you don't even want a little bit of it um, because it grows. And on the grounds that, so, so, Participatory economics was sort of begun from the premise that 
if there's any way you can actually avoid having markets come in um, that's remotely practical, that would certainly be well worth considering. So in a participatory economy, you again, you have workers' councils that are sovereign over what they do. Um, you also have a more structured organization of consumption activities. You have neighborhood consumption councils and you have federations of consumption councils that are basically handling you know, the situation about how much, pub how much of our resources should we devote to producing public goods. Um, so on the consumption side, there's a more organization of consumption rather than everybody is an individual who just goes and buys in markets as a consumer. Um, and then there, <laughs> a participatory economy, the proposal is that you replace the market for coordinating all these activities with a planning procedure that the worker councils and the consumer councils engage in directly themselves. And the usual vision of that is, well, okay, democratic planning by the workers' councils and the consumer councils, I guess you mean they each elect a representative and they send them to as a delegate to a meeting and they do the planning, and then maybe everybody votes on the plan or some planning alternatives. That's what people usually think you're saying when you talk about democratic planning. And the thing I have to spend most of my time disabusing people of is we didn't propose that at all. That's not, remote, doesn't remotely resemble what it is that we said would be what we think is a far better way to go about democratic planning or participatory democratic planning. Um, instead, what we proposed is that councils make proposals about, notice, notice in that common vision, you would have delegates coming up with a very elaborate plan that maybe would be subjected to some sort of democratic vote. And my own personal view as an economist is that that would be a disaster. That if any successful revolutionaries actually tried to do that, um, by you know, 15 days after they started, they would realize, oh my god, we got nothing here. This can't be done this way. Um, the people at that meeting wouldn't have the information they needed to make sensible decisions. That process doesn't generate the information. I think it would be host, it would be the kind of naive nightmare that the capitalists tell us is what we must be dreaming of. Um, and I hesitate to say that because I never want to say that the capitalists who tell us that we're fools have any reason whatsoever, that it's entirely prejudice on their part. But I think that that is the danger of sort of some of the visions of democratic planning. So, oh, so what's the alternative? The councils make what we call self-activity proposals. They basically say, a workers' council says, we want to produce this, and this is what we're going to need to do it. Which for an economist means, here's the list of inputs that we're asking everybody to tell us and approve in the planning process. Please give us this, and then we're committed to, if we get that, then we can commit to the fact that we're going to be producing this and supplying this. And the neighborhood consumption councils basically say, these are the consumption goods we want. And the procedure is an iterative process where we are generating more and more accurate estimates of what is the cost of society of using this resource this way? What is the social cost of producing this? When you use that information, you can evaluate consumption proposals and you can say, wait a minute, your self-consumption proposal, it costs society this much. Did everybody in that neighborhood actually have sort of, is their income sufficient to warrant that? And their income basically comes from what we call their effort rating at work. Um, and for proposals that are coming from workers' councils, we've, they've said well, we're willing to supply these outputs. We're requesting these inputs in order to be able to do it. Well, we can use the information that this procedure is generating, and actually each round the information gets more and more accurate. We can use that information to evaluate these proposals that are coming in from workers' councils. We can look and see, well, what's the benefit to society of everything you're saying you're going to provide? What's the cost to society of letting you use the resources that you've said you're going to need? Well, if the benefits are bigger than the cost, the rest of us would be perfectly happy with that. We have no reason not to tell you to do whatever the hell you want to do, provided it's being what we call socially responsible. And socially responsible means 
not using resources that belong to all of us and should benefit all of us in a way that's less efficient than they could be used by somebody else if somebody else was given permission to use them. So we're proposing, so the process is there's preliminary information and estimates about costs, social costs and opportunity costs. Self-activity proposals come in. Those estimates get adjusted in light of, <clears throat> in the beginning, there's going to be many more demands for everything than there are sort of supply and willingness to produce. And what the procedure does is it whittles down those discrepancies until you finally get to a plan that could be enacted. But I think what is sort of most notable about the process, there's three things that are noticeable about this procedure. Um, one is, notice that there are no meetings of delegates to hash out a plan. The meetings take place inside a workers' council when they come up with their self-activity proposal. The meeting takes place inside the workers' council when they have to make some revisions in that proposal and only they can revise it. No planning authority can say, oh, we heard what you wanted to do, but no, you can't do that. It doesn't work out. We know better. Um, instead, you have to, we, we're, we're going to now send you our revision of what you have to do. So workers are making self-activity proposals about what they want to do. They're not making proposals about what the whole economy is going to do. And they are the ones that are responsible for revising those proposals. Only they can revise it. And you don't need a sense. At some point, somebody has to say no to a proposal that is socially irresponsible. If a neighborhood proposes, for instance, um, we want to consume all this. But what if the cost to society of consuming all that is very, very large? And this neighborhood, these people haven't worked any harder than anybody else. That's socially irresponsible because it's too greedy. It's unfair to the rest of us. So you have to have very easy ways for measuring and indicating when a proposal is what we call socially irresponsible. And as long as it's not socially irresponsible, people ought to do whatever the fuck they want. Um, that's why this I consider to be a libertarian socialist approach to planning rather than sort of a traditional social, you know, approach to planning. This is why there are some anarchists that think, oh, Participatory economics is really kind of an anarchist economy, and then there are some anarchists, of course, have great different, you know, differences of opinion. But so the first thing is there are no meetings of delegates to hash out a plan. The second thing is what's proposed is always a self-activity proposal by a workers' council for themselves or by a neighborhood consumption council for themselves. And finally, there's nobody who says no if a consumption proposal is too greedy? Who says no if a worker council keeps sending in a proposal that says, but when we look at it, the benefits to society are, don't warrant the costs that they are incurring to produce those benefits? That would be socially irresponsible use of public resources. Who's to say no and say no, that should not be approved? Well, if it's easy to tell when proposals are socially irresponsible, you don't need a central planning authority to have that power. You can simply leave it up to councils vote to accept or reject other councils' proposals. And it doesn't take a hell of a lot of time because it's very easy to see. So th that, that is essentially, and I now I've gone on longer about what it is that the participatory economic model looks like. There's other parts of it too. But essentially market socialism has self-managed cooperatives integrated through markets, and participatory economy has self-managing workers groups and self-managing neighborhoods participating in a kind of democratic planning that I think is qualitatively different from what people have ever envisioned, and, is the, and, and for that reason is, is both more practical um, and actually, I think, more desirable. Does that mean that these um, workers-owned corporations will still compete with each other on a greedy, capitalist kind of way? <laughs> well, they compete, from, they, they compete in the following sense. In the planning process, what is a group of workers doing? They're, they are essentially bidding 
to get permission from everybody else to be allowed to do what they want. Now, part of what they want to do is they want to be given permission to use scarce productive resources. They want to be given permission to use machinery. They want to use permission. They want to be guaranteed. They're saying, we need somebody else who produces a necessary. We're going to make shoes. We need somebody to send us the leather. So we need this much leather, and we need this much you know, labor of this kind and other. Well, the view in a participatory economy is all those productive resources actually belong to everybody. And everybody should roughly benefit equally from them. So what we're really doing is figuring out who's going to make best use of them. And that's what the planning procedure is doing. And this is actually a complicated question in market socialism also, and the Yugoslavs had to deal with it. Well, in, in, in a Yugoslav firm or a market socialist firm, do they own the machines that are sitting there? In a participatory economy, if, you have a, if your proposal has been approved, then what you've been told is you get to use them because you've shown us that you are going to use them responsibly. So they're free to use as you want. Does that mean that you could then sell them and you know, take the procedures? You know. So suppose we have been granted use of some very expensive machinery. Does that mean that we could just decide to sell it off and retire and go to the Bahamas with the proceeds? Well, both in market socialist alternatives to capitalism, they have to deal with that because the answer for them is also no. And the answer for us, I think, the answer has to be no. How do you make that answer no? Um, so we're used to, we're used to, we're used to ownership societies, where ownership means that you can do anything you want with that. And in fact, what happens in participatory economy is what are, what the, the planning procedure allocates user rights, which is not exactly ownership. Now, this has nothing to do with whether you own your own shirt or you own your own jewelry. But it does have to do with who owns? So the view of a participatory economy is, well, it's actually all of us who own all the productive resources. I actually think that, that, that one way to think about this is the commons. The commons consists of all the machines. The commons consists of all the technology. The commons consists of all the land and the natural resources. And quite frankly, the common consists of what economists call, call human capital. That's the skills you know, that people have in them. You know, both through education and through talent. That's the commons. That's the productive commons. And I think one of the tenets of socialism from the get-go is that belongs to all of us. And each generation inherits that from previous generations. All that productive potential is what we inherit from previous generations. We as a whole inherit it. It's not that individuals amongst of us uh, inherit it. And so what we're looking for is, well, how do you allocate user rights over all of that so it's used effectively to produce the most well-being, but that doesn't mean you're actually granting what most people would think of as ownership rights over those things. with other councils or other uh, goods in other parts of the world, where, whether there is any interaction or okay. the word trade um, between um, of, of resources or even the gift economy or, I don't know, other, other ways of conceiving that. Or are we talking very much about essentially self-contained economies? Um, and, what, and what size or scale do you envisage those being? This is a big issue for people who come at this with what I call a community-based economic vision. Um, and the community-based economic vision is, so I'm, I'm going to get to the answer, but the community-based economic vision is semi-autonomous areas 
that, because they're small, can engage in face-to-face -face democratic planning of what they do. And <clears throat> the question I always pose to people who have this vision is, you said semi-autonomous. You didn't say autonomous. You didn't say that the region, that these small regions are literally sort of economically self-sufficient. And of course, they immediately say, well, no, they can't be completely self-sufficient. I mean, that would be very, very inefficient and in some cases impossible. So we mean semi-autonomous. I said, OK, let's put aside how you're going to do all that democratic stuff within your sort of small area here. And I certainly concede that smaller groups can engage in more face-to-face -face democratic process easier than larger groups. I mean, that seems rather obvious. But let's put that aside. Just tell me how you put, what is your proposal for how you take care of the semi part? And that's where, in my, in my experience, there's sort of no answer to that. Except, well, I guess we'll just, I mean, the, these communities will have to trade with one another. I said, you mean trade like in a market? Is it going to be a free market? And that's where things unravel. Or the answer is, no, 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 of course I don't mean a market. Um, they'll have to talk to each other about that. I mean, they'll have to actually sort of you know, get on the phone and talk to one another. I said, well, that's sort of like send the delegate to the meeting to plan out what the division of labor looks like. That's what you mean by the semi, and I don't think that's going to work either. Now, notice that how do workers' councils interact with other workers' councils and consumer councils in, the, in, in a participatory economy? They don't meet with them. They just send in a self-activity proposal. And what they get back is sort of more reliable information, even for them, about, well, wait a minute. Now we have more reliable information about what you're using really costs society and what you're using really benefits society because we've found out what other people want. So do you want to revise your proposal in light of sort of updated information? So, there's no, in, there's no need for a direct interaction between, so can you have literally millions of these units participating in this process? You can have millions. I mean, the, the model does not, it's not, it's not a size specific. There's no particular reason to think it's any more or less practical if, if practiced by only the state of Oregon or only Cascadia, which is California, Oregon, Washington State, British Columbia or the United States. Now that's, so my answer to, to one of your questions is, once we have a national economy that's a participatory economy, it doesn't matter how big the nation is. This is how all these units are interacting. That's the whole point, that we have a procedure for how they interact that's sort of practical and useful and presumably you know, delivers desirable results. Um, now that, you, you can't say that about international, about so international. So you have, you have nation states, and they engage in basically two kinds of international economic relations. One is trade, and one is investment. And the question, I think the, the, the difficult question would be, well, suppose you had a participatory economy in uh, Venezuela. I spent three years trying to convince them to do it. Not yet. Maybe. Suppose Venezuela is a participatory economy, how does, does this mean that they can't participate in the global capitalist economy and trade, you know, import goods and export goods? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Um, they can trade just like any other national economy can trade. Um, here is the one difficulty, and it's a moral difficulty. Um, suppose Venezuela is trading with a country that's a poorer economy, like an African country. Well. When there's trade, there's basically an efficiency gain, or else they shouldn't be doing it. And if there's an efficiency gain, that efficiency gain gets split between the two countries that are trading. Well, don't the principles of a participatory economy basically demand that if Venezuela is going to trade with the Republic of Africa, or the Republic of the Congo, that it would be it would undermine the whole principle of fairness that the Venezuelan participatory economy is based on if they didn't agree to terms of trade 
that gave more than half of the efficiency gain to the Republic of the Congo, a much poorer country. So I think that when, if, particip- if, if we had nation states that were practicing participatory economics, if it was a country that was trading with a wealthier country, they should do what every country does now, which is try and get the best terms of trade they possibly can. There's no moral restraint on what they would go for. They'd get the best terms they could. On the other hand, if a participatory economy is trading with a, no, with a poorer economy, I think that it would undermine the sort of commitment to fairness that's kind of the glue, part of the glue that keeps the system together unless they were careful to abide by what I call the 50% rule. The 50% rule is you better be sure that the poorer, the poorer party in the international trade is getting more than 50% of the, of the benefit of the efficiency gain that the trade is producing in the first place. And you can apply the same rule to international investment. But there is no reason that a single country that set itself up with this kind of an economy could not trade with the rest of the world and engage in investment activities vis-a-vis the rest of the world if it found those activities to be of benefit to it and if it was willing to be sure that when it traded with poorer trading partners or investment partners that more than 50% of the benefit went to the poorer party. The burden of your talk was to argue that um, what's really valuable is to have some kind of economic vision beyond capitalism um, and, the, and that there are some promising signs in relation to that at the moment. Um, but obviously, like, people at the press doubt about that. Um, and and you know, people who are committed anti-capitalists express doubts about that all the same. And I, and I guess a couple of those are as follows. Number one, some people argue I mean, you just can't know. You know, the level, of, the level of detail that you've started to go into already, and which is in much greater depth in the, in the work that you've produced, you, you know, how, how can we know that? Right? When we're trying, thinking about a system which is fundamentally at odds at the, uh, to the kind of system that we have right now. Um, and so some people argue that we should have a much more kind of basic or like elemental conception of what we want instead of what we have now, you know, some, some foundational values, some sense of what solidarity means or certain forms of empowering human interaction, but we just can't know. And then another challenge, I suppose, is even if we can know, how relevant is it to us now? Um, given how historically weak we are at the moment, um, is this something that all really to be concerning us, you know, if, we, if we're trying to sort of mount some kind of fight back against austerity, say, um, where do our energies go? And certainly, in my, in my experience, you know, the work I've been doing um, hasn't involved when I've been trying to sort of get people involved in activism who haven't previously been involved in activism. Uh, it's tended not to involve communicating elaborate and complex visions, um, but communicating in a different way. So. Yeah, I guess there's a question about, you know, some people on the left would be sceptical of this whole project, the project of this book, and both your, yours and Eric's approach to this kind of thing. Uh, I'll, I'll try and be concise so we can get it so, so people can, can say some more. Um, look, uh, it, market socialism was once actually tried. So one of the things is, well, if it's never been tried, how can we know? And um, somebody pointed out today, well, what that comes down to is saying, well, you're never willing to innovate. I mean, if it hasn't been tried and you won't think about it, much less do it, then you basically just don't believe in, the, in innovation. Any innovation is trying something that hasn't been tried before. Um, so I do think that, and, and in that regard, market socialism has a, a distinct advantage. Because the first thing I am asked by anybody who is sort of relatively new to this, well, okay, I've heard you, and it sounds reasonable, but of course, everything sounds reasonable when somebody knows more about something and they're talking to you about it, so how am I to know? But has this ever been tried someplace? And I actually have a complicated answer to that, but the, the, the true answer is no. Um, <laughs> oh, this is recorded, isn't it? Very unfortunate. Delete that. Um, I mean, 
something like this has been tried in a few cases in history. I mean, it was tried in Republican Spain, it was tried in Barcelona, it was tried in Catalonia, it was tried under very difficult circumstances and actually worked pretty damn well, something like this. And there's lots of things out there that are not whole national economies that have gone on for years and years and years where things like this are going on you know, today all around the world. That's a lot of what the new economy looks like, actually. But in the case of market socialism, we have an excellent example of that being put into practice in Yugoslavia from 1951 up to 1980. Now, most people's impression is, well, Yugoslavia, that didn't work out too well. So I guess it was not, I guess it was a failed experiment. And that is just so totally wrong. When you think back about the period, the period I just described, 1951 to 1980, was there an economic miracle on the planet during that time period that everybody learned about and was aware of and so frightened of in the United States that, they, that the automobile workers were smashing the Japanese automobile imports? Wasn't that the period of the great Japanese economic miracle? Yes, and it was an incredible economic miracle in terms of how, how rapidly the Japanese economy recovered and how well they recovered from the devastation of World War II. Do you realize there was another economy during exactly those same years that had even more spectacular growth and basically performance in all the traditional ways? It was the Yugoslavian economy. Worker self-managed market socialism worked terrific in Yugoslavia, and it had nothing to do with the sort of very, I'm not going to say nothing, but very, very little to do with the demise of Yugoslavia, that sort of the unraveling of the, of the nationalities and the ethnic strife and everything else. So I would say that one of the advantages that people have who advocate a market socialist vision is they can actually point to a period of, that's a significant period of time in a national economy that actually had a hell of a lot of problems that they had to overcome. With hindsight, that's very obvious. And yet it worked out rather remarkably well. Somebody really wants to know, I just want to know it's not going to all fall apart on me if I do this. No. Market socialism, you put it in place, it doesn't all fall apart on you. And I can't point to something sort of like that that's ever been done in the real world. So yes, doing a participatory economy is basically taking a greater risk on innovation. On the other hand, I think we have learned that, and, and, and Eric put this to me, he put this question to me. He said, well, Robin, what if it turned out that the transition to a participatory economy went through a period of market socialism, would you be terribly upset? I said, I, I'd be so happy. I mean, if we can go from neoliberal capitalism back to social democratic capitalism, I'd be happy. If we can go from social democratic capitalism back to, way forward to, is what it really is. If we could go from, if we could go to market socialists, if people weren't willing to give up markets until they had at least done this other thing first, if they were, if they were sufficiently worried that it's just all going to fall apart, it's really not going to work, and they felt like we've got to go period, you know, through a period of now we don't have capitalists, we don't have private enterprise, we've got cooperatives, we've got consumer cooperatives and worker cooperatives, but we're really going to let the market system sort of coordinate that for a while. I say, fine. And what they will discover is that they need to tame. And when they discover that it's difficult to tame and that they need to go beyond taming, then maybe they will say, hey, there's this thing called participatory planning. We can now do that. We don't have to sort of keep these markets around as long as they haven't corrupted things sufficiently by the time people figure that out. So in terms of you know, <clears throat> how can we know, those are my, sort of, those are my answers to that question. In terms of, is it worth thinking about this? I was not, I mean, I was not of, I was not of political age during, you know, the great battles of the 30s and most of the social democratic reforms that were won in Europe during the, mid, the middle part of the century. Um, I am really a child of the 60s. Um, but from everything I've read and from everything that I've seen and the evidence that I've seen, those reform movements were much more powerful. They packed a bigger punch. And I do believe it's because there was a much more self-confident group of anti-capitalists that were in the core of all those struggles. So I think that it, it is important. False confidence isn't going to do any good. 
I mean, a lot of those people obviously were delusional. Most of the people who were dead convinced they knew a better alternative to capitalism thought that Stalin's Russia was heaven on earth. They obviously were delusional. They know that now. We know that now. They didn't know that then. And I'm not preaching, let's be self-delusional again and convince ourselves that we really have a better idea when we really shouldn't be convinced we have a better idea. But if we can go through, that's why I think it's important. What matters is the quality of the discussion and the quality of our ability to grapple with the issues of how we would do things differently. If the quality really improves, and I think it has rather dramatically, then we don't have a false confidence that we have you know, a better solution. Then we have a real confidence that this time is based in reality rather than some sort of delusion about something that's beautiful when it's really not. Emma Goldman thought that the Soviet Union was terrific. And she was there a month and realized, oh my god, this is not right. But most people didn't travel, and most people didn't know, and most people, when they heard the capitalist press telling them the Soviet Union was a hellhole, said, of course, that's the capital press die, lying to me. So I'm not preaching that we need false confidence, but I'm think, I, I think that the kind, and I'm all, I also don't think it makes sense to expect people coming into struggles around, you know, most of the people coming into Uncut want to talk about a successful way to keep them from raising tuition rates and defunding education. So to insist that, well, I'm sorry, but you have to sit down now and listen to a lecture about how we're going to plan the economy after capitalism is gone, that makes no sense. But that's never made any sense. And no good organizers have ever thought that makes any sense. OK, I'll stop. Employment, workers, you know, like there's less sort of, there's more planning, you know, and less people doing competing with the task. How that, yeah, how that sort of works or doesn't work. You take a few at a time, maybe now. Yeah. So the idea of a basic income, universal Basic income, guaranteed job. Okay, yep. Cool. Um, I guess, yeah, how would you see the transition? Uh, to a participatory economy, and do you see already some seeds of it in the present? Uh, and can it start from a small scale, or does it have to start from a big scale? Okay. Uh, um, yeah, in the case of the study, what do you think would the, the negative consequences of maintaining the market? Okay. Let's do that one first. We'll work backwards. Um, Inequality increased steadily in Yugoslavia from 1951 to 1980, both amongst individuals, like income distribution amongst individuals, the salary rates for sort of higher skilled and higher educated people escalated faster than the salaries increased for lower. Income differentials between men and women increased during that time period, income dif and income differences between regions, poorer regions and wealthier regions. And I don't think that's any accident. I think that when you basically, when, when, when you use a market system to coordinate, then I think that one of the principal things that, you know, one of the principal problems that you face is that, you know, that you have a difficult time struggling in to prevent rising inequality both between regions and, between, and, and among people. Um, the other thing that happened was that participation rates in the worker self-managed enterprises just steadily went down. And there were a lot of sociology grad students that did PhD students in the 60s and the 70s. And they, would, they, they went over and they studied the actual process of decision making in these Yugoslavian enterprises. And they looked at it over time to sort of see what's happening and who's participating and who's not. And what they discovered is what we all would, have, what, 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 when you think about it, you would probably predict that participation rates on average, on, as a whole, participation rates declined. And, on, and, and partition, partition, participation rate amongst the people sweeping floors all day declined far more rapidly than participation rate against people who were doing managerial type tasks. 
Um, so I think that, <clears throat> I think it's also, and, and part of the reason for that was that in a market system, really it's a bottom line that counts, and you might as well get somebody in from a business school to sort of make the decision for you. Um, so part of the reason participation declined was there really wasn't any room. The market competition was eliminating any sort of room for maneuver that it was worth discussing. And then the fact that they did not sort of make any drastic changes in the organization of work and the jobs that people were performing, they basically allowed the what we think of as capitalists, but it's almost it was universal to capitalist, communist, the sort of traditional divisions of labor. Um, Disempower, continued to disempower um, a majority of the employees, and of course, why would they participate? Um, the question about transition, and does it have to be big? Um, the have to be big is one I've struggled with a long time, um, and, and there I feel on the least comfortable ground. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, so in Venezuela, they created what they call a new part of their economy called the social economy. And a large part of the social economy consisted of brand new workers' co-ops that the government worked very, very hard to create and set up. And <clears throat> they invited me down to sort of provide, and they were, they, the Venezuelans, by the way, had already done a, sort of a critical evaluation of the Yugoslav experience. And they looked at it because they had already told the Cubans, yes, we want your doctors. Yes, we're happy to trade oil at decent prices for medical clinics and doctors. Um, no, we don't want your advice about how to run elections, since you don't have any. And no, we don't want your advice about how to run our economy because we don't think your economy runs very well, and that's not what we want to do. Um, so <laughs> they instead created a whole new part of the economy. They didn't nationalize much. Um, they just tried to grow a new economy that was a good one that they liked beside the private one, postponing the issue of what are you going to do with the, with the Venezuelan oligarchy. But they were very concerned that when they did this, that if all these cooperatives just continued to you know, trade and buy and sell in markets, that what they concluded was the negative experience from, Venezuela, from, from, from Yugoslavia would repeat itself. Um, and the, you know, the top leadership of Chavez and all of them had sort of done this study and come to this conclusion. So they wanted to know, is there anything we can do about this? Um, and it's very difficult to do in piecemeal. Um, it's very difficult. That's where the, you really have to have a market system. Either you're going to use a market system or you're going to set up this participatory planning process. You can't set up the participatory planning process for one little place. Um, because what it's designed to do is tell you how you could sensibly allocate the scarce resources that belong to everybody in a way that's efficient and democratic and equitable. Um, so it's that part of the model is not something that you can try in miniature. Now, that doesn't mean you can't try worker self-management in miniature, um, and it's done in a lot of different places. That, means, that doesn't mean you can't try out balancing jobs you know, in a different kind of way. And there are enterprises sprinkled around the world that have done that. Some of them just because they actually read this idea about, well, if you don't do a reorganization of work, you're just gonna, things are just going to slide back into their usual old patterns, and that's what we didn't want in the first place. So some things you can do in miniature, and then there's one part that I, do, I don't think you can. It's also why I think there has to somehow be a kind of a rupture where no matter how long it takes, and even if people had to go through market socialism to decide they want to do it, somehow you have to make a decision, are we going to stop using the markets to make all these decisions for ourselves, or are we going to actually try and, and, and plan, this, plan this out? Um, so that would be my answer to that. Um, basic income, yes, great reform. Let's fight for it and win it. Um, guaranteed job, yes, great reform. Let's fight for it and win it. Now. I say all that, but then I would step back and say there's a lot of reforms 
that we could be fighting for. And I want to look and see how much would we gain if we got it, and what's the probability that we could win it. And if somebody convinced me that in a particular country that one of those things was well worth fighting for because it would really be a substantial improvement and we have a high probability of winning it or higher probability than winning something else, I'd say, well, that makes a lot of sense. But I don't, know that I, I don't think that's necessarily the answer every place. And it may be that those two specific reforms shouldn't be as high a priority, but those would be the reasons. You just have to weigh how much good would it do and what's the probability of getting it. Now, that's different from having another criteria which says, oh, but is it a non-reformist reform? And you actually don't want to get me on that subject because I don't think there is such a thing. And that makes me very unpopular amongst 90% of my friends. We've just got a few minutes left. So we can have another round of maybe, um, maybe quick questions or comments. Like if there's anything that anyone wants to throw into the mix, anyone disagrees with Robin on particular things, it'd be interesting to hear. Or, um, Matt, did you want to say something? And you? I wasn't sure, but... Yeah, so hard, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it was just quite interesting because you talked about like competition and how we allocate resources and how that being you make a proposal about how efficiently you use those resources. I was just wondering like how leisure fits in and like with the productive resources being as such, like how would we decide for them if you have like a two day week or whatever. So we'll have the final comments and then uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, I was wondering like, uh, uh, what would happen say, if, if, if the kind of productive forces got to a level where you can almost kind of like mechanize production and things like that. I mean, how, how, how would that affect as far as that? Would you, would you need, I mean, do you need, do you need full employment to help Paracon? Or can you guarantee full employment under Paracon? Because I wonder if you don't have full employment, how do you make those kind of decisions? and? and allocate decision making powers to people, you know, but how much to the best to... One of the advantages, but I'm going to forget these two. Okay. One of the advantages of any comprehensive planning system is the plan will have a job for everybody. Yeah. That's part of what you're doing. And in any market system, you can't do that. And, but I don't claim that as an advantage for participatory planning any more than I would point it out as what it was but it was an advantage for the central planning of you know, Stalin's worth period. Basically, they, they know how many people they have, and they know how many in every, every labor category, and one of the things the plan does is it says, we're going to have a job for you every place. Um, so th th on, let me stop there. And yours, remind me what yours was? Oh, okay. Oh, and, and this, this, this is actually somewhat similar to your question about is the, look, as technologies improve, as the forces of production develop, um, then what that means is that we can get more, it means, it means either we can get more working the same amount of time or we can get the same amount working less time. And clearly from an environmental point of view, one of the big problems that the kind of capitalism we've been living in is that, and this is Julie Shore's point, Julie Shore, the overworked American, the overspent American, what she pointed out, there was this, this fact that hit her in the face one day, which is productivity in the United States had doubled over a period of time, and the average number of hours that an American worked had increased at the same time which meant that we had taken less than 0% of our productivity increase over a 30-year time period in the form of more leisure. That's an environmental disaster, and it's also a human well-being disaster. It's just totally crazy, and you have to ask what kind of a system drove us to do such a thing, and that's one of the things that's wrong with that system. Um, so on the other hand, there was a belief that well, when the forces of production, I mean, part of the old socialist belief that dates back to Marx was, well, there's a period when, you know, socialism, people are still going to have to work, but at some point, there's going to be so much plenty when the forces of production have developed sufficiently that 
you know, anybody can have whatever they want, and that's when you can have communism. Um, I think that was always a mistake. Yes, we're going to have a tremendous amount of, of, of technological progress, hopefully, if we don't asphyxiate ourselves with, you know, with, with catastrophic climate change over the next 100 years. If we manage to avoid that, we can have, continue, we can have a tremendous amount of technological progress. We ought to increasingly be taking it in the form of leisure rather than more goods and services once there's plenty enough. Um, I don't think that means that tasks that nobody really wants to do will disappear. As long as there are tasks that we need to do that don't disappear, then you essentially have to deal with the fact that, yes, we have work, and we have to decide who's going to do those tasks and what they're going to be compensated for. So I don't think that that part disappears um, and that somehow we magically solve all problems because we don't need anarchist accountants because everybody can have all they want. Don't even need to count things anymore. Just go take it. Uh, I think that, that part of... That part of the vision that was, you know, played a role in sort of the anti-capitalist movement, I think, was one of the great self-deceptions. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you.